Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Homes on Homes podcast. Today we're gonna to be talking Frank Cozzolino. And Frank, did you realize that uh, we have been filming for 20 years? No, but now that you make me think about it, 2001, uh, yeah, 20 years. 20 years, you it's have been, been with me doing years. my show. Started off Homes on Homes, has gone crazy into every type of homes, but it doesn't matter. 20 years, been on television now 18 years, and yes. soon will be 20 years on television. But we've been filming since day one. There's been a lot of changes when it comes to electrical. There's been a lot of uh, things that have happened in, in ESA, in Electrical Safety Authority, Definitely. along the way, and even to the point where it became the very first trade that was, uh, that you could be fined for not following procedure, not getting permits, playing with electrical when you're not licensed to. Mm -hmm. So let's, I, I wanna talk a lot about this today and sure. I, I wanna get into, let's just start it right out. Homeowners out there, you need to know this. When do you need a permit? <laughs> Very simple answer. Anytime wire comes out of my truck, I need, I need a permit. It's clearly that easy. Um, if I'm changing a receptacle, I'm changing a switch, do I need a permit? For me, as a contractor, the answer is no, as long as I'm not altering a circuit. The minute that a circuit's being altered, so I'm adding wire to the circuit, running a brand new one, I need a permit. It's that simple. If you're working with aluminum wiring, the electrical code says that if you have aluminum wiring and you're a homeowner, you decide to change your own switch, you need a permit. I don't as a contractor, you as a homeowner do. You need to be a licensed electrical contractor to even pull a permit, correct? That's correct. So there is a lot of misunderstanding on, you know, what the duties are of a licensed electrical contractor, an electrician, a master electrician. Three totally different things that a lot of people seem to confuse. A master electrician is simply someone that understands the business side and I'm speaking in layman's terms, keeping it very, very simple for everyone that's watching. A master electrician is needed in order for an electrical contracting company in order to conduct business. What's an electrician? An electrician is someone that is allowed to do work for a licensed electrical contractor. So when you have an electrician that comes to your door, knocks on the door and says, hey, I'm an electrician. Well, that's great. They're not allowed to work directly for you they're allowed to work for an electrical contractor, not for a homeowner. So the only person that's allowed to work for a homeowner is a licensed electrical contractor. Master license compared to an electrical license. Is one better than the other? Well, again, no. A master electrician is someone that understands the business side of it, and they are employed by an electrical contracting company in order to help run that company within the letter of the law. Okay, but a master electrician also means that you've gone to school completely to the limit for industrial, for residential. You cover all aspects of electrical, yes correct? Yes no. Okay, explain it. All right, so the master electrician gives me business courses that I need to know. I need to know what, uh, if one of my employees has um, any questions that end up arising when it comes to Employment Standards Act, I have to know the answers. Uh, employment insurance, I have to have the answers. That's the business side that they teach us when we write our master's license. So our master's license doesn't make me a better electrician. It just means that I can assist an electrical contractor in order to run their business within the law. So let's just say, what exactly should any homeowner ask a licensed electrician and or LEC, a, a licensed electrical contractor, what are the questions they need to ask? Hey Frank, my name's Mike. Okay, Mike. What do I need to know about you coming into my house? You need to know that the person that's coming into your home, if they're there to quote the job, so you just have a salesperson knocking on your door, or it's an actual electrician knocking on your door, the two questions you need to ask is, who's the electrical contractor that you represent? Really simple. It's the electrical contractor that is going to be filing the paperwork with the Electrical Safety Authority to make sure that your job is going to comply to the Ontario Electrical Code. And, and we do realize how important it is to comply with Ontario Code. Well, the fines are huge. 
And that's my point, because this is the one trade now, and I wish all trades, to be honest with you, had the authority to fine homeowners, fine contractors, fine anyone that is doing things wrong. Because if I steal a pack of gum, I'm going to get charged and I can go to jail. Correct. That's simple law. Mm -hmm. Okay, at least electrical, because it, bec it becomes a safety issue, a fire issue for your home. We have put this in place that anyone can be fined. So let's, let's talk about that. Who can be fined? Homeowners, contractors. And the person doing the work. And the person doing the work. So it, really, everyone can, be, everyone can be fined. And the, the beauty, if I can call it a beauty, the money goes to the Ontario government. So you actually get prosecuted through our court system. So the money doesn't go to ESA or come back to the contractor. The Electrical Safety Authority, and it's my understanding, they simply assist with providing the information, the evidence, if you will, in order to have this prosecution go through into the court system. Okay, so that just that's tells me it's a law. Simple. It's the law. Wiring is not a hobby. It, it shouldn't be taken as one. You, you know a little bit of electrical, that's great. You want to play around in your own home? Sure. Pull out a permit. Let's have someone come out there and make sure that the work that you did is proper. Now, you have an electrician that's a buddy, and he's going to come over and do some work. The minute he advises you on telling you, well, you should be running that wire from A to B, he just told you what to do. He's liable. Okay, that's a good point. Now, there is a, we're going to call it a, a shade of gray area. Okay. And not 50 shades of gray. There is a shade of gray when it comes to working with homeowners and ESA themselves. Homeowners, in a way, are allowed to do their own electrical, correct? Yes, they are as long as they obtain the permit. And they're the only other source other than a licensed electrical contractor that can pull out a permit on a house. That's right. Being the homeowner. Correct. So it's not, not your electrician. Right. So again, simple. Electrician's allowed to work for a licensed electrical contractor. That's it. They can't work for you. So did you get that? That's pretty simple. I think that's straightforward. Very but as a homeowner, if they want to tackle the electrical of their home themselves, mm -hmm. as long as they pull a permit, they work with ESA, they work with the government, and I don't want to say the government because it's, it's going to become the government if you get fined, but they're working with the Electrical Safety Authority mm -hmm. to make sure that the electrical is done right. As a matter of fact, the inspector, and we'll call him the electrical inspector, from ESA will come out and work with the homeowner to make sure they're doing it correctly. Well, of course. The last thing we want are, you know, I think what we all want is a safe province of Ontario. We want it to be electrically safe. And that's where the Electrical Safety Authority comes in and does their job to make sure the electrical installations are done to electrical code and safe. Does that mean that they open every single device and check every little piece? If they think they need to. Exactly. So that's to the discretion of the electrical inspector. If they're going to go in and check on a homeowner's work, they're going to be asking key questions. And if they're hearing the right things, they may not need to open. That becomes their discretion on what they decide to check and what they don't check. I'm going to tell you an honest little story that happened to me. Oh my goodness, I'm getting older now. This would probably be whew, almost 30 years ago. Before I knew you, huh? Yes. Thank God. Okay, yes. so what'd you do? So almost 30 years ago, I rewired a whole house, right? I didn't do it with a permit. I'm just being honest. I'm shaking my Back head. Back then, a lot of contractors didn't do it with permits. But I mean, I knew electrical because my dad taught me. I knew electrical because I've been hands-on experience since I was a little boy. I rewired the whole house. Someone, I assume, phoned the mm -hmm. permit office. An electrical inspector knocked on the front door, and I was there. Mm -hmm. So when, he, when I answered the door, he just said, hi, what's your name? I told him my name. I said, what's your name? He'd give me his card. He says, uh, I understand you're doing electrical in the house. And I said, yeah, I'm doing the whole house. And he said, uh, well, you didn't pull a permit, and I'm gonna go through this entire house with a fine-tooth comb, mm -hmm. and if you've done anything wrong, Mr. Holmes, you're gonna be in trouble. 
And at the time, there was no fines. This was just a point that I could be in trouble, uh, that I guess I could have a bad name for playing with electrical at someone's house and, you know, to watch out. Hey, I know better. Uh, but at the time, the homeowner didn't want to get a permit. I mean, I didn't push it at the time. The inspector went through the entire house mm -hmm. and he said to me, he said, this is some of the neatest work I have ever seen. Why aren't you a licensed electrician? I said, I'm a general contractor. I can do plumbing, I can do electrical, I can build the house, I can design the house. Do I have to become a licensed electrical con At the time, do I have to become an electrician? Because it wasn't licensed electrical contractor. Mm -hmm. And he said, to be honest, no, but you need to pull a permit. I pulled the permit, everything passed in the long run, grew a great relationship with the system of mm -hmm. what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, you know, that's the way it was back then. Really, most people didn't pull permits. Well, Since television of 20 years, I think permit has gone through the roof mm -hmm. from building, plumbing, HVAC to electrical. That's so much that everyone has recognized, hey, if I'm going to do work in my home, we need to pull a permit. Mm -hmm. I'm still seeing people not pull permits. Like yes. you're on one of the jobs right now that we're doing that the contractor stole, as far as I'm concerned, $20,000 from the homeowner, played with the electrical, gutted the place, mm -hmm. left all the debris and walked out the door, took every penny they had. He was supposed to do the whole job, basement, bathroom, kitchen, bathroom upstairs. That's two bathrooms, a kitchen and a basement for $20,000. Does that sound right to you? Not a chance in hell is no. that ever going to happen. Okay, so there was my honest moment for the day, well, but I did the job right. I got the permits, and from that day forward, I never touched anything again without getting a permit. Because it's simple. I'm the guy that wants to do things right. I'm the guy that wants to educate everyone out there to do it right. It became known to me that the more you document what you do, the better purpose for you, me, and when I say you, resale of the home. Correct. Pulled your permits, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, structural. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a package that you can introduce when you're selling that house that everything that was touched was done with permits. And this is a funny thing because we have within the laws of electrical now to be the, the ability to fine everyone. There is no more favoritism here. Everyone can be fined if they mess with electrical. Why, when it comes to selling a house, which drives me insane, it really does, and I know it's another podcast and I'll play this, I'll play this question again. Why is it when it comes to selling a house that uh, a, an agent can say, all new electrical, all new plumbing, all new, 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 but never present any permits that were pulled. You know what? Uh, to your point, I would love to be part of that podcast. I'll even invite six to seven different real estate agents just so we can hear what they have to say because I'd love to be part of that. Well, you know what we do. It's, it's not like I throw cinder blocks through windows. What I'm trying to do is solve problems along the way that don't make sense to me. That should not be allowed. You should not be able to say, but legally they can. Why? Because the homeowner of the house that's selling the property says, we did all new electrical. We did all new bathrooms. We did all new kitchens. We did structural, uh, opened up open concept. But no permits are ever presented, and I don't want to say ever, rarely presented when it comes to buying a house. Mm -hmm. I want to see a package presented in front of me if I'm the buyer, I want to see that package that says, not just you talking about what was done, Show but me. here's the package. Prove it to me. Now I'm going to feel really good about buying that, that house. However, what is the biggest issue right now when it comes to buying a home? You asking me? Yes. Well, knob and tube is still lurking around, but the big one coming is aluminum. And the minute you f see a finished basement, you need to ask yourself questions. Was it finished properly? Not just the lipstick and mascara, the plumbing, the HVAC. We're talking the electrical. Because if there's a problem with the electrical, we're going to have to fish wiring in. Which After. means we're going to be chopping up your ceilings. You're on one right now. Yeah, well, I'm on a few, yeah. No, I mean we're, phase house, right? Well, phase house, yeah, I'm doing my best to give her some advice. And 
when she's said and done, by the time she plasters, re well, we're going we're gonna to have to go in and, of course, chop up the home in order to get all the wiring where it needs to be. Once that's done, then someone's going to come in and plaster the holes and then repaint. Where does she live in the meanwhile? Okay. Is the question. This is a good point. Faye used to work for the homes group. And she's learned so much over the years on what she needs to do. So she went to buy a house with her husband. Mm -hmm. They buy a house. They ask the homeowners, mm -hmm. was permits pulled on everything? Uh, on the electrical, they made actual, <laughs> the seller sign a paper that there was no knob and tube in the home. It made them feel better. Yeah. The homeowner actually signed that paper. Frank goes in to do a test and troubleshoot, which I recommend everyone does, and we'll talk about that in a minute. What is a test and troubleshoot? Frank goes in, does a test and troubleshoot. Lo and behold, there is knob and tube, not throughout the whole home, but nope. throughout Enough key half. areas. Well, the entire second floor, and then the loft. Of course. That means I need to chop up the main floor in order to get to the second floor. Right. Because from the panel to that area must direct lines. So what's the problem with this? The problem with this is now they have, are going to an experience a bill that they did not expect when they purchased this home. Yes. That becomes a legal issue, unfortunately, for the buyer, for the seller. And it's a, it's a legal issue that no one wants mm -hmm. because lawyers are the only ones who win. I don't care what anyone says. They're the ones that get paid. They're the ones that take it to court. And even if you win in court, was it worth the headache, the hassle, the stress? How in the hell do we solve that problem? Now, if you ask me, all you have to do if you're gonna buy a house is pick up the phone and ask about that address to ESA, were was there, there permits pulled on this home? Well, there's a fee when we end up doing that. So there, I believe it's through And you the, can do this. Yeah, well, anyone can. Uh, it's through the, I believe it's Freedom, Inf Freedom of Information Act, and I think it's like 50 bucks. I believe. 50 Even if bucks. it's 100, it's cheap in order just to pick up the phone and double check that these people are telling the truth. Because the homeowner in the particular case that you're talking about did everything themselves. Like, when I say everything, everything. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. If ESA would have went out and inspected, at least you'd have a little bit of, of you know, trust that things were done correctly for cheap hundred bucks this is the point of spending the money now and not having to spend the money later so test and troubleshoot and this is something that i came up with years ago and frank you'll remember this that as we continue to film the television show and house after house after house had electrical problems, plumbing problems, structural problems. It just never stops. And today, by the way, it still doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. I said, we should be setting up a test and troubleshoot for people that want to buy a house. People that live in a house and don't know if the electrical is up to, up to code. Do a test and troubleshoot. It's a simple thing. Tell me approximately how much it would cost to do a standard test and troubleshoot for you to go to anyone's home, to give them the advice they need, to give them the advice about buying a house, because if you're going to do an inspection process, you can do a test and troubleshoot on electrical, on plumbing, on everything. How well, much? When you're, okay, when you're, when you're dealing with the seller, the seller would have to give us written permission that they're going to allow us to open up all the devices. So um, if we're going in and only using a plug-in tester and just plugging into the devices, that's one thing. If we're going to open up each device, make sure that everything's nice and tight as it should be and ensure the wiring you know, is what they said it is, then it takes a lot more time. So an actual full test and troubleshoot, roughly, uh, depending on the size of the home, anywhere from six to eight hours worth of time would be needed. Um, we recommend new devices at that point because devices do wear. There is an end of life to devices, plugs and switches. Um, so roughly two grand would, uh, would end up taking up the day of time. Okay, but it's probably the best $2,000 anyone is ever going to spend. Um, I, yeah. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. But even on a simple test and troubleshoot, simple and I'm talking about if you want to buy a house. On a simple test and troubleshoot which would be you going in without opening anything, looking at the panel, checking receptacles, doing a visual. That's going to be minimal. 600 bucks? Yep. Okay, 600 bucks. That's minimal. Why aren't we doing this? 
I honestly don't. I wish I could tell you why. I, I honestly don't know. Why didn't Faye do that? I th well, if you want me to give you what I think, I think that homeowners in today's market are too busy trying to not lose that deal. Which is not my enough point. inventory. Which is my point. Right now, there's such a boom in selling the houses yes. that people are lining up mm -hmm. and bidding on these houses. Yes. People are getting way over asking, and we're letting go of the most important things that we need to know. Is this home safe for me, my children, mm -hmm. and the future? Well, Faye's, Faye's home uh, had, like we found at, at least 15 different devices, like plugs, that were ver reverse polarity. And what reverse polarity is that if the shell of whatever you're plugging in is metal, that would have actually had a chance to become live if there was a short so in a that circuit. So a shock hazard. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. How many times, you know, when I was as a kid, I'll never forget this. I'd go into the kitchen, lean against the stove, and we'd be like, did I just get a shock? Well, obviously, you didn't get enough shocks. I used to have straight hair. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's funny. Eh, I try. Years ago, things were wired without ground yes. and not understanding ground. And, and many homeowners, when I was a kid, fixed their own houses. They couldn't afford to bring people in. That was the normal. I get that. That never is a misunderstanding. Or was it terrible? Was it safe? Well, probably not. Mm -hmm. Why did I get a shock when I touched the stove? Tell me. Well, it, there's so many different reasons it's probably why you would get a shock. And there is no ground. And it could have been reverse polarity, even though it was a two-wire system. So many different reasons on why you could have got that You shock. said something a moment ago that I don't think anyone really pays attention to. There is a life expectancy on every receptacle on every switch, mm -hmm. smoke detectors, mm -hmm. the new smoke alarms. They don't want to say smoke detectors anymore. It's now a smoke alarm mm -hmm. uh, with the flashing eye thing. And that's just for anyone that possibly may be deaf. What they want to do is cover every single possibility of saving lives in case of a fire. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that there's a lifespan on a receptacle. How many houses have I walked in and that receptacle well, has think, been there for 50 years? Well, think about it. You've got a device that when you're plugging in a male end of a cord, it's got the receiving end, the female end, if you will, where there's little prongs, little metal, sorry, little copper prongs on the inside that would catch that receptacle like a sleeve. and hold it in place. Yeah. And, and, you know, with time of plugging in, plugging out, plugging in, plugging out, they of wear. course, they're going to wear. Everything has an end of life. Everything does. Our devices, as you clearly mentioned, no one's ever thought of that. But seven to ten years is what the manufacturers uh, recommend, and I agree wholeheartedly. There's something new for you. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense to me. You know, how do you check it? Um, there are special testers, but what I tell people all the time is seven to ten years. Most people listening right now are probably going to, you know, they're with you. Fifty years. This house is fifty years old. I've never changed them. Maybe you should. You know, your connections are getting old. If you notice flickering lights, if you're noticing lights that dim a little, then come bright again, there is sometimes when that's normal. Uh, but I'm telling you, when their lights are flickering or they're they're pulsating at you. That's not normal. Or plugging something in and you're actually seeing an arc in the receptacle. Well, depends what you're plugging in. You're plugging in that laptop, sometimes it's actually normal because the laptop is instant on. So the minute you're plugging it in or unplugging, you'll see that little bit of a zap. In those cases, as much as I don't want to say it's normal, it is. Okay, um, I want to talk more about this RFI, Request for Information. Can anyone do this? Anyone. So I can pick up the phone, call one eight seven seven esa safe I think that's their number. Either way, it's a quick phone call, and I simply give them my address, and from there, they'll be able to give me whatever permits are open. So a homeowner, if they wanted to check their own home, can mm -hmm. pick up the phone, call this number, esa safe one eight seven seven one eight seven seven esa safe Right. And they can... Get the RFI request for information on what permits were pulled on their home. Yes. Now Simple there is, as that. There is a fee. Small charge. Small charge, but you get, you get proof that, you know, if the last homeowner has told me that, oh, I, you know, I, I updated all the electrical, 
and clearly you can see a brand new panel. Um, that doesn't mean that they did it legally. Uh, you know, it was it wasn't that long ago that people used to go in the you know in the Greater Toronto area, pull the meter, do their work, and then put the meter right back on. Like they somewhat worked safe. That is against the law today, but there's still people out there doing exactly what I just said. You wouldn't have called the ESA because you just pulled the meter yourself, did the job, put the meter back on, job's done, pay me. Here's what I like. Tail light end. Uh, it's, it's probably the most easiest thing you could do is to find out if your home has had permits pulled on electrical. Yes. To find out if you need anything done to the electrical. If the home is not new, it means the electrical is not new. Mm -hmm. This is pretty simple. If the house is over, let's say, seven years old and nothing's been touched, obviously there needs to be some upgrades. So when it comes to this, we're talking about over the years, like I said, 30 years ago, I learned I better start getting permits. Mm -hmm. Permit changes are, are maybe not every year, but there's a lot of changes when it comes to electrical. Many. And for you, because you're a master electrician, you have to take these courses. What do people need to know about the changes to code? The beauty is they don't. Um, it's up to the electrical contractor in order to notify the customer what they're about to do. Just hopefully they're explaining what they're about to do in your home. Uh, making sure that they comply to today's electrical code, that's up to the electrical contractor in order to make sure that they've complied. ESA, the Electrical Safety Authority, then comes in during the inspection to make sure that everything complies. So as a homeowner, you don't need to know the changes. The electrical uh, contractor needs to stay up on, on many, many, many code changes that happen uh, every year. Well, there, that makes sense changes. to me, but I mean, I've seen code changes along the way when it comes to electrical, and one of them was that uh, uh, smoke alarm with the strobe light, where the location is, one's gotta be in every bedroom of the house, uh, on the second floor, in the basement, every level of the home, and every bedroom of the home. It's very, very rare that someone gets to correct Mike Holmes, but this is a perfect opportunity, and it is taped. So Mike, that's a building uh, code, not electrical. As per electrical code, we need to answer to building code, meaning that if there's a building code that affects us, we need to do everything in our power to make sure that we satisfy that building code. So the reason the electrician puts in the smoke alarm is because it's a building code requirement. But if you're Same with vapor barrier around our box. But if you're, changing not electrical. if you're changing the electrical in the home, you have to comply well, with again, the codes. No, no, in, in, in solutions, like for our company, uh, we word it very, very carefully. Here's what it costs. This is what we're planning on doing. It's a building code. Uh, Ontario Building Code states that this, is, this needs to be done. Doesn't need to comply by electrical code. The, the electrical safety authority doesn't come in looking for smoke detectors. It's especially so on a renovation. You're, t you're telling me if a home is renovated, yes. an old home, yep. it's being renovated, yep. and you are rewiring the whole home. Yeah, I'll, I'll make your head spin in a sec. You finish that line. Are you required to put in the new strobe smoke alarms? Before I answer that, I'll, I'll answer it with another question. Your childhood home, remember your, your bedroom for argument's sake, you probably had one or two receptacles in your bedroom. Correct. Meanwhile, today's code would ask for three or four. By electrical code. Every 12 code, feet. Yeah, well, six feet from the door and every 12 feet from there on in. According to electrical code, I just need to make it safer than what it is for that home that was built in the 1900s. Even if you're rewiring the house? I don't need house? to add the extra receptacles as we just discussed. A good electrical contractor will automatically add them in. But for that cheap homeowner that wants to rewire the home because they're selling it, they only need to rewire what's existing. Holy cow. Yeah. So electrical okay, code, you me a lot like, you're welcome. So uh, electrical code is a lot like building code. We give you a bare minimum. Now it's up to you to surpass it. You surpass the building code every day that you're on a job. In electrical, we do the same. Maybe that's why I think it's code period, because that's what I do every day. Maybe that's why you and I have gotten along for 20 years, plus. <laughs> anyway. Okay, what about a homeowner out there that wants, I mean, there's curious people. Maybe they want to know about changes in the electrical. Could they? 
They, well, they can. Um, when you're taking the upgrading courses that are available through the Electrical Safety Authority and many other uh, agencies out there that offer the training, um, it's not really geared in layman's terms. So I don't know. That makes sense to me, actually. Well, it, you got to understand that we follow an electrical code book that is about yay thick. It's written by lawyers for the blue collar. So we have a hard time keeping on top of it. So the training is actually good for us because we've got people that help us interpret that code. Again, written by lawyers for us. So it's, uh, so it's a, you know, they're big shoes for us to fill and stay on top of. So having the ESA inspectors, we're always in their ear asking for their advice on certain things. That's why sometimes you may get an electrician that's gonna say, let me get back to you. I'm gonna have to double check the code on that. It's, you know, it's a fairly thick book. Now in residential, it's a lot easier. Um, there's less that we need to follow. In the commercial world, industrial world, far more. I try to stay out of those two worlds because it's just too much for my little brain to handle. I remember when Joe, we called him Little Joe, you've seen him mini on the me. show many times. <laughs> yes, Mini Frank, uh, Mini Me. Uh, when he was going to get his license, I was so proud of him because you trained him right from the beginning. You, he, he started with Frank worked with us for years yes. and, and what happened was that he had much like i do we make it right on every single home we go in we are above code electrical plumbing structure especially structure never mind electrical joe went to do his test and he answered a question incorrectly and uh, did he fail or he almost failed because of it well he got that question wrong for sure he ended up passing overall but that one question in particular that he remembered uh that he he ended up getting it wrong because he was actually answering. What we do every day. Yeah. Make it better, make it right, above code. But the answer to the question was he didn't have to do it, but he said, we have to do it. So I was kind of proud of that moment. I really, you know, I just was because it's been distilled in his head that on an old home, yes, you must go six feet from every door receptacles, every 12 feet from that point. Yes. And I think. ESAs, I think that was the question, actually. It may, it may have been, but on a retrofit, you don't have to. And the, the rationale behind it, that's the, the beauty of, you know, the beauty of Ontario Electrical Code would be that there's always a rationale to the code. Um, and their rationale ends up being that they don't want to make you go poor trying to make your house safe. So having it safer than what you have today is the goal. And as long as they make it safer than what you've got today, then they've satisfied what they, you know, what their mandate is. Yeah, I don't mind that then. I really don't. That means your existing electrical to your home. The whole goal is to make sure you're safe from electrical shocks and a fire. Yes. But here's the problem. You're buying a home nowadays. You're in the greater Toronto area. You're about to spend a hundred grand, whether you like it or not. Sorry. <laughs> hundred grand, maybe thirty years ago, one million dollars. Yeah, exactly. You're you're gonna spend a million dollars nowadays to be in the Greater Toronto area, and you look at the electrical and doing it bare minimum. I say no as an electrical contractor. Very very simple. After I leave and my permit passes with the bare minimum receptacles, as we you know as code allows, um, what are you gonna do as a homeowner? You're gonna start running extension cords. So if the ESA inspector was to come in three or four days after you've actually moved in and you start using those extension cords, you're now in violation of the electrical code, which lots of people don't seem to understand. An extension cord is for temporary use, not for permanent use because I don't have another receptacle where it should be. Like I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the number one electrical fire is from use of extension cords. I'm going to back that up and say yes. I don't what people have will do in an older home is they'll plug in an extension cord because they're cold. It's an older home. It leaks. It's, it's, it's a freezing day outside. <laughs> and they bring in that heater and they turn it on high and put it right near the bed to keep everyone toasty warm. Mm -hmm. That is the, the, the f most foolish thing anyone can do. If you read the tag on the heater, it says that cord must be plugged directly into the receptacle, not into an extension cord. I'll give you one better. 
it also says it needs to be a dedicated circuit. That's my number one call for October and November. In those months, I get call after call of, of receptacles that just mysteriously stop working. And the reason they stopped working is that the wire somewhere along that circuit has actually fried. And why did it fry? Because it was such a heavy load that you were plugging in, into that circuit. It, it requires a dedicated circuit. Read the manual, which no one does. I'm going to help some, a lot of people out here. You ever had an extension cord that, uh, for whatever reason, looked curled like, uh, like Frank's hair right now? Hey. But when you bought the extension cord, it was straight. But all of a sudden, it's curled. That's because it's been under a heavy load, correct? 100% correct. And or a surge. Yes. But mainly, it's been under a heavy load. Yes. I'm actually surprised that you knew that. Well, you I'm a me. contractor. Yeah, well, a, a I have one. a lot of extension yeah. cords. Well. I'll pick up my cords and go, why is this curled? What the hell well, was then again, this you, put under? You also purchased probably a 16-gauge cord where the heavy duty ones are 14 gauge. Or 12, which or 12. I have 12 gauge, by the way. And then those don't curl. Why? Because it's a bigger gauge line. It can right. handle it. So little things that we, we, we need to know is that, I mean, how many times have I seen this? And especially when I was younger, my, my mom would say, Mike, you gotta go buy some more fuses, right? Because the 15 amp fuse blew in the, in the electrical panel. Now everyone should be on breakers, but even that, still needs to be inspected because again it's got a shelf life don't ever take out if you still have fuses and i know there's still people out there that have there fuses are. don't take out a 15 amp and put in a 20 amp or a 25 amp or a 30 amp don't do that I've why said I, i've said it a million times like imagine that the breaker the fuse, sorry, we're talking a fuse is set for 20 amps, where the wire is a 14 gauge wire that's good for 15 amps. Now we want to make sure that 80% of the load is normal use, so it's actually only good for 12 amps. But here we are, we're going to draw 15 amps every once in a while, okay, it'll hold. But if we have a circuit where we've got that little portable heater plugged in, and for argument's sake, I don't know, your TV along with your computer. Computers actually draw quite a bit. The older, you know, maybe not a laptop, but the older uh, desktops. And as you're using all this, if the circuit starts to pull more than 15 amps, the wire starts to get hot. Then the fuse turns around and says, hey, I'm good for 20 amps. Meanwhile, the wire is still getting hot. So what's going to burn first? The 20, 25, or sorry, 20 amp fuse or the wire that's only good for 15? The wire. Once that blows, where in the wall do you think that it, it blew? Which is your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, but that, and they're lucky that it didn't cause a fire because well, think may. about that wire heating up. But it may. That's the trick. A lot of people take a chance and say, oh, wire blew and it's, oh, it's okay. No, it's not okay. We need to find where that blew because if it is behind that wall, the power's still live going to it. It is an electrical fire waiting to happen. So or can be. It can. The reason people will pull out a 15 amp fuse and put in a 20 amp fuse as a, an example is because that fuse keeps blowing. And there's a reason that fuse keeps blowing and that's what everyone is missing. Yes. There's a reason. So don't up it because it will, by upping it from a 15 amp to a 20, which I'm gonna go into further detail in a second. If you were to do that, you are creating a possible fire hazard for your home. So if a fuse is blowing, you got to call in a licensed electrical contractor that can bring in an electrician to solve the problem. Don't create one is what I'm trying to say. When do we want to have a 20 amp breaker? To my knowledge, we're going to have them at the, ki the kitchen sink or at the kitchen counters. Because so many people plug in, they want to plug in a toaster and a kettle at the same time and they blow the breaker. Mm -hmm. If it's not split, which we call a split receptacle, with two dedicated lines to it, it can be run as a 20 amp, correct? Okay, so the code has actually been there since the 70s. Don't ask, don't quiz me on exactly when in the 70s, but the code's actually been there for a while. You can use a split receptacle, which is exactly what you said, 15 amps on the top, 15 amps on the bottom, giving you two separate circuits. In one receptacle. All in one, and that's a split receptacle, or 
a 20 amp receptacle, which is usually a different looking device. We call it a T slot. So, why are we now using more T slots than the split receptacles? I can answer this. Okay, go. Because we're running less wires to it. No, the code changed. Remember okay. you ended up saying that homeowners want to know when code changes? Well, again, it was to make it safer for you as a homeowner, let's GFI protect it. The ones that are within that meter of the sink, let's GFI protect those circuits. So in a kitchen that, you know, a longer kitchen for argument's sake, you've got two receptacles close to the sink. Those need to be GFI protected. You can do that one of two ways. Running a 12 gauge wire to a 20 amp receptacle placing in a GFI and then up and over to the other. So now both of these items are going to be GFI protected. Or if you have a split receptacle, you can purchase a GFI protecting breaker. And which is more money. Which is a lot more money. So what contractors, and these, these are the people that do brand new homes, um, you know, spend as little as we can, will end up not doing the breaker. Of course, they'll run the 12 gauge wire and place in a 20 amp GFI at the sink. Okay, so to the homeowners out there, what is a GFI? In layman terms, you're hearing contractors talk about GFI. It's actually a GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter is what it stands for. Correct. This was mainly set up when it comes to a wet zone. Uh, Dad went outside, he plugged the, the weed eater into an outside receptacle that is not GFI protected. This is how code comes into effect. He's doing the weed eating, but the grass is all wet. And his shoes got soaking wet, soaked that water right through to his feet, and he has now become grounded. He's now grounded himself, so direct to ground, and that's how somebody can be shocked and harmed very much so. So that's how GFI or GFCI came into play. Now it's just no different from your sink. If you're within three feet, you need to be GFI protected. All exterior receptacles need to be GF, GFI protected. And that's for your safety, your kids' safety, and something you should think about. Mm -hmm. Wherever there's a, a, a sink, think of it that way. If you've got a sink there and there's a, a chance of something that's plugged in falling into that sink, you want to make sure that it's GFI protected for your safety. How many movies do we got to watch that someone puts the radio on the side of the tub that's been plugged into the wall? Does that make sense to you? Not to me. No. <laughs> no. But for those people, we want to make sure that we protect our, you know, our simple. And one people. last thing that is really driving me insane. You cannot put a chandelier in your bathroom if you can reach it from the tub. What's wrong with that? Don't you swing from the chandelier? Isn't that a song? A lot of designers out there, it looks really good having a chandelier in your bathroom. It does. But if you can touch it from your tub, that means you can possibly die because you are grounded when you're standing in water and attempt to touch something that has electricity in it. So for items like that that are within, not within reach, but bare minimum, if you're going to have a chandelier, which some people will do and they'll keep it, you know, seven feet up, I still recommend at that point to GFI protect that circuit, which again is very, very simple to do. But if you can reach it, I agree 110% shouldn't be there to begin with. Yeah, okay, so you're telling me that means I can have a chandelier in my bathroom as long as it's GFI protected? Well, is there a shower head that is sticking off the wall that can spray me and then... Splash. Splash on the fixture that's not rated to be in a wet zone? No, no. but you're telling me I can have a chandelier as long as Over it's GFI protected? Over a tub? Protected? As long as I can't reach it. There's the point, as long as you can't touch it. I love this because this is something simple we do. We try to educate you. That's, that's everyday Joe Blow out there and Mary Harry. Uh, probably Mary doesn't like the middle name Harry. However, it's her husband's name. It's her husband's name. The point of this is to educate you on the little things you need to know that make sense for your home. It's about safety. It's about, we don't want a fire in our home. That's a very big expense. You end up losing everything mm -hmm. all because of what? I didn't know. You know, and I, no. that's what we call ignorance. And it's, let's, let's, We're if past. you don't know, you pick up the phone. You can call a company like Frank. You can call the Electrical Safety Authority. You, there's, there's ways to find out. You can go online. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Don't mess around with electrical because you could die. It's that simple. Thanks, Frank. Anytime. So Harry and Mary understand that before they hire that 
electrical contractor, they're going to ask for the right paperwork, right? And they the want to see a permit cost. They want to ask who's the electrician coming out and doing the work. And they're going to make sure that they've got all the proper uh, ESA ECRA paperwork on their invoice or on their estimate. You should, uh, like, we need to follow a lot. Like, we follow a lot of guidelines in order to make sure that we're out giving you an estimate. Homeowners don't know this. They should ask. They, anytime they call in a contractor, a general contractor, and maybe the general contractor contractor is not truly a general contractor, but they are because they got a license as a GC. It doesn't mean you're going to get the best advice from them. We need to go direct to the doctor. Right? Yes. Think about that. You're not going to ask the neighbor, you know, my elbow's really sore. Something's wrong with it. You're going to actually go to the doctor. If you want to know about electrical, you need to go to the right people when it comes to electrical. You hit it on the head. A GC can give you an idea of what the electrical is going to cost. But listen, you're the homeowner. You're the one that's going to be paying this bill. And if the GC is going to make some money on it, okay, fine. There's management fees, whatever. I don't care about that. But ask to see the electrician's bill because you need information on there. You want to make sure that, that electrician is actually a licensed electrical contractor, not an electrician. You don't want an electrician. You want a licensed electrical contract. Okay. That's the message. Last point here I think is important. Uh, when I guess we're talking about Ontario, this is relative pretty much across Canada when it comes to electrical code. Everything starts to change when you step into different territories. Now we move down to the south and I'm talking United States. When it comes to code, all codes are fairly close per region. Canada, United States, building, plumbing, HVAC, electrical. But the differences would be is where they're at. You know, is my duct work for HVAC in the attic, which like, uh, people have got to stop doing that. It just doesn't make sense to me in a hot zone or in a cold zone. Don't even think about putting it. But they do because it's almost like you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? Mm -hmm. It's because it's what they're used to doing. However, when it comes to electrical, it's relatively the same from Canada, United States, well, hopefully uh, you'll learn something new again. Um, we have a national electrical code, and the Canadian electrical code is adapted from the national electrical code. So in the US of A, of course, they follow the national electrical code, and then they, of course, different uh, states would have their variation, and the inspection offices work a little differently. Here in Ontario, we're blessed with an agency that's going to come out separately just for us called the Electrical Safety Authority. If you were in uh, Alberta, I'm almost certain, unless they've changed it, the building inspector will also take care of the electrical inspector. Or they can if they're qualified. Correct. So, again, when it comes to National Electrical Code, the Nas we, our Canadian Electrical Code is adapted from the national electrical code and in the province of Ontario we adapt from the Canadian electrical code. So there's different small differences but at the end of the day it's just one great book that we follow and we adapt from and it works. What I'm trying to say is that throughout the country of Canada and the United States it doesn't matter every area is slightly different still works within the national electrical code but it's slightly different. So wherever you are, could be out east, could be out west, could be up north, could be down in Ontario. All you have to do is pick up the phone and find out. And that's the important point. And that's what we're trying to get through here is that if you want to know, you can know that easy. Either you can use the, the, the good old Google uh, search or visit ESA's website because they actually have a tool right on there that says, you know, locate an LEC, a licensed electrical contractor. You just put in your postal code and a bunch of names pop up for you. I didn't know that. It's really simple. And it's a good way also to make sure that I've paid my dues and I'm still active. So it's really nice. On the website, we're talking ESA's website, you can report. Yeah. Tell great. me about that. You can, okay, so you have a contractor who did something wrong. <laughs> Don't call me. I can, nothing I can do. Visit the ESA website. And there's actually a tool on there that's going to say report an incident. Go in there and you can tell them exactly what happened. They'll investigate it. The more information you give them, the better. 
you know, general contractor came in. What was the co general contractor's name? ABC Contracting. What's their address? Blah, blah, blah. Give them as much information as you can, and then they will get into the investigating and trying to find and hopefully put these guys out of the industry because they're out there every day. They're, they're just taking your money and causing a mess. And then because of the mess they're making, you've got a show. I'm tired of doing the show. I'm tired of doing the show too. Okay, and well and let's end these bad contractors. Uh, I'm into that. And now we have an easy way of doing it. Go to esasafe.com. You can find out everything you need to know and you can report a problem so that the ESA has the right information to check it out and hopefully solve it for you. Uh, Frank, I can't thank you enough for being here. Again, to me, this is just about education, trying to help the, pu help the public, give them the info they need and to keep their homes safe for them and the kids. I'm thinking my kids. Thanks for being here. Anytime, my friend. This episode is brought to you by Improve Canada, Canada's largest home improvement center. Check out improvecanada.com. If you like the show, check out the episode page on makeitright.ca for more tips.